question. You should see my screen. If it's not the case, just let me know. Um, so I'm Nicolas van der Butte from uh, Subchains. I'd like to introduce myself simply as saying that I'm someone genuinely passionate about demand planning and inventory optimization. Uh, I'm working with my team on delivering projects on these two subjects worldwide. It's very simple. If you have a question about demand planning, about inventory planning, I'm the guy. You can send me an email. I'm very happy to discuss, always happy to discuss on LinkedIn as well. And well, it's as simple as it gets. We're very passionate about what we do. Um, we're so passionate that I've been writing three books on this subject. So if you're interested to know more, you can follow me on my blog. I'm trying to publish, I would say, once a month, once every three weeks, a high quality article made with love. I also have three books. Um, if you want to learn more about doing your own forecasting model, I'm starting from scratch in Python. You can use data science for supply chain forecasting. So you, you will learn how to use machine learning to forecast demand, really starting from zero. So if today you've never heard about it, that's the perfect book to start. We really start from zero and step by step, we, we create models. If you want to learn about inventory optimization, uh, I have my blue book on the right side. Again, we start from very simple things and we refine model throughout the book and it's done in Python. Again, very simple code, step by step, so you're gonna learn along the way. Finally, if you're more kind of a demand planner, demand planning manager, or an SNOP manager, and you want to better manage your process, uh, my latest book, Demand Forecasting Best Practices, will teach you how to do that. The whole book is about tips, tricks, best practices on how to manage a demand planning process. So no code, no technical model in this book. It's much more uh, management oriented. Um, by the way, my company, so Subchains, that's how I make my living. We, as you understand, we specialize in demand forecasting and inventory optimization. We like to train teams. We like to code our own model or to coach you so you can make your own model. As, as I like to say it now, basically what we do is that we reduce your forecast error and we reduce your inventory level, and this is what we do. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, I'll move on to the real subject for today, uh, outlier management. Before we start, as you know, wait, no, I have a first line here, sorry for that. So outlier management, let's, let's recap what we're gonna talk about today. Um, I guess that if you're connected to the call, you know this kind of painful experience. Maybe you are a demand planner or a supply planner yourself. You have kind of a time series like this one. You have demand for a product, and then you have one point that kind of stick out. And you're like, is this an outlier? Should I remove it? Should I flag it as an outlier? Should I remove it from the data set? Or is it normal? What, what should I do with it? And that's the exact subject of this uh, webinar. We're going to divide this in three subtasks. First, I'll try to discuss with you what's causing these kind of weird points. Then we're going to discuss how can we detect them. And finally, how do we correct that if we need to correct them? OK, so causes, detection, and then correction. Um, now comes the, the big important one. Um, I like to interact with everyone. So I would love if you can connect to WooClap. You can just scan the code here using your phone. And then I will use this to ask you a question. It's for free. It's very easy to register. So you just have to scan this with your phone and you can join me online so I can get your opinion. I already see that we have 40 people joining. That's perfect. So for those of you who just joined, welcome. I see that we have now 100, uh, nearly 130 people joining. You can just scan um, the picture I'm sharing on my screen so you can join me on WooClap and um, you don't see my screen. That's maybe because you joined too late. Okay, I'm sharing, sharing my screen again. You should be able to see it. Yeah, so you can just uh, scan this using your uh, phone. I will also copy the link directly on the conversation so you can just uh, click on the chat. Give me a sec. No, that doesn't work. Just give me a second. I'll go online and copy. Copy it for you. Voila, that's the one. It's always difficult, sorry, to go share my screen and send you the link. Voila. So in case you missed it, you can just click on the link in the conversation and you can join me uh, on WooClap. Perfect. So first question for WooClap. Currently, I guess most of you are demand planners working in supply chain. Um, and I guess that if you join this webinar on uh, outlier management, you have issue yourself 
uh, with Atlas. So can you just try to pinpoint what's causing, what are the main uh, reason why you have outliers today in your data set? Um, if you think that I missed something on this slide, which might be the case, don't, don't hesitate a second to just type it in the conversation uh, so I can see with you what else is causing you trouble. I'll just show the result in a few seconds, so I'm not influencing anyone. Some of you are still complaining that the screen is not visible. It looks like in Teams that if you join the call after I share the screen, you don't see it, but I think you should be able to see it. Benjamin, do you see my screen? Yes, you do. Perfect. Okay, let's see the results. So, 31 of you, uh, we have equality between promotion and shortages. And shortages, it can be quite painful for many companies due to this duplication of order. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you have a shortage and then your client just keep on making the same order over and over every day until you deliver it. And then you can see spike in orders. Um, I also see that a few of you said others. Um, that's that's interesting. Don't hesitate to um, type a comment about that so we can directly discuss what other reason you've uh, seen. Um, I see Elenius data here, 34%. So that's also kind of painful for you. OK, let me move on and try to discuss these outliers. Again, sorry for Teams. I'm, I'm not yet used to doing webinars on uh, Teams, uh, but I hope I get more uh, used to Teams over time. So what's causing outliers? The way I see it, <clears throat> you have two different flows of outliers in a demand data set uh, in supply chain. You have first all the thing I would call wrong data. You know, it's people that mistype something in SAP, that's just something wrong in the Excel file you're using. Someone who type two zeros instead of one zero, this kind of totally wrong data, okay? The second thing are real business events that change demand, impacted demand in one way or the other, okay? It could be promotion, could be a shortage, price changes, these kind of thing. Okay, so for me, it's very important that we make a difference between these two things, between erroneous data on one hand, and legitimate business events on the other end. As you're gonna see, I'm not doing this segmentation just for the sake of it or for the theory of it. No, it is because we're gonna deal with them differently later. Um, before I move on, I would like to ask you a second question. How do you detect outliers? I'll just launch the question now. You can again join WooClap to answer that. Again, if you don't find that my answers are good enough, you can directly type what you think on the conversation. So we can discuss it there. Uh, and I see that in terms of outliers, I have supply chain disruption. I have the weather. That's also very interesting. Um, again, you can join WooClap by just clicking on the link I just shared with you. So feel free to just uh, click on this link to join me on WooClap. OK, I guess I have some sort of survival bias because none of you said we don't face many outliers on the program. Well, that's the subject of this webinar. So I guess that if you're here today, it means that you have somehow a problem with with outlier. And that's great because we're going to do everything we can to solve it. Um, so most of you are saying something like, hey, you know what? I have this thing that detects outlier based on some sort of deviation to the mean or in some software it's called this interquartile range. Um, that's the name, I think, in SAP IVP. So that's that's the most common technique by far. The other one would be where well, we just do it manually. OK, let's um, move on. I'll show you some techniques. So if you read my book, you know that I really love to first try to discuss the current practices and explain why it's a bad idea. So let me do that uh, here once more. So before I explain the bad practice, let me go back to this slide for just one more minute. And just highlight the fact that most of you are using deviation to the mean as a way to detect outliers. So let's discuss about that. So deviation from the mean, the idea is simply saying, well, I have a time series. I'm going to compute the mean of that. I'm going to compute 
the standard variation around the mean. And if I have a point that's kind of far away from this average value, I just say that this is an outlier. Okay, that's that's the basic concept. You have a bit of ref refinement in some software, but the basic concept is really just saying this is the average demand, and anything that's way beyond that should be wrong. Um, how do we correct that? Usually, as soon as the point is flagged as being wrong, we're going to decrease the value back to the mean. Okay, so that's a very simple technique. It's very straightforward. Unfortunately, this is not a good idea. It's definitely not for me a bad practice, and I show you this in the next slide. Before we move on, let me just say it once more, because I know that at times I tend to go really fast. First, as a detection, what do we do? We just highlight points that are far from the mean. So here I just computed the average demand. I computed the standard deviation and anything that's above, let's say, two or three times the standard deviation or four times as you want is considered as an outlier. And then once something is detected, I just replace this value by the average value. OK, and then it's back into this green zone. Perfect. Now. This is not a very good idea because this kind of statistical um, this, this statistical detection will flag erroneous data entry, so real wrong thing. The same way it's going to detect some real business events that should be just considered as normal business. Okay, so anything goes, anything is kind of detected and will be corrected, even if these things are not real outliers. So that's not super great. Also, the way this technique is defined, it basically says something as well, I'm going to take the one or two percent worst cases and consider them as outliers because that's what we do here. We say anything that deviates too much from the mean is considered as an outlier, but basically it's based on a standard deviation to the mean. So in any kind of data set you have, you will always have one or two points that are kind of far from the mean. So you have a technique that might flag a lot of values that are actually not outliers. They just it's a high or low value, but this, this thing happened in the supply chain, right? We all have a lot of variation everywhere. But then we also have another issue. Once we flag an outlier and we say, well, this point there, we, we don't like it and we want to um, improve, we want to correct it. We don't have a real strong technique to correct it. Here, the only thing I did is simply sign, well, this one is wrong, so I'm going to replace it by the average demand. But that's really a simple guess, so it's not so smart, right? But finally, we have the worst thing is that this technique doesn't work at all as soon as you have a trend or a seasonality. So here I show you a data set with some sort of seasonality. And if I look at deviation from the mean, you see that during the high season, points are, I mean, it's natural that they're higher. And then these are flagged as outliers, but this point is not an outlier. Unfortunately, there is another outlier in this data, data set. You can see it on the arrow. And this one is not detected because it's quite close from the average. But actually, if you look at the seasonality, this is an outlier. It should not be so high. OK, so this deviation from the mean that most of you are using, I would say this is not a good idea, and I definitely don't think it's a best practice. And again, if I look at the graph here, 46% of you said that they're using that. But the great news is we can do better. So let me show you best practices to solve these outliers. So again, I kind of segment these outliers into data entries that are wrong and real business events that we should include. So first thing first, we need to flag any wrong transaction. So we should really go not at you know the monthly bucket that we see in our normal planning software or the weekly bucket. We should really look at it transaction by transaction and remove or correct the wrong transaction. I'll show you how in a minute. Then once this is done, we should make a, uh, a demand forecast engine that includes business drivers, such as um, you talked about promotion and shortages. You said the main causes for outliers are promotion and shortages. Well, actually, as soon as you have a demand forecast engine that includes promotion and, and, and shortages as an input, these are not outliers anymore and you don't have to deal with them. Finally, because you can always have some remaining weird data points, you can still try to spot them based on forecast error and then bypass them. I'm going to go back to this technique uh, later. Uh, let me then go through these three steps in detail one by one. Uh, what I'm going to do, instead of starting very theoretical, I'll show you cases of things we did in the past, so it's going to be very, very practical, and I'm sure you're going to recognize some of these cases might, might apply to you. So first case study, it's about flagging these wrong transactions. You can see on the left side of the screen, this is a real data set from a client. 
you see that most transaction when it's just a few units, right? Maybe it's 100 maximum, that's it. And then there is one transaction where you can see that it goes to nearly 2 million. Now, what's happening there is that actually, if you look at the SKU number, it looks like someone typed the SKU number directly into the transaction. You see that the SKU number, it's 1918-212, and you see that the transaction demand is 1918-213. So actually, if you look at the transaction by transaction data set, you realize that there we have a problem and we should actually very easily correct this by just removing the SKU number from the demand data set. And that would work. Let me show you how that would like. So here I took the data set. I just remove this uh, point. I decrease it to one. So I took this data set here. I changed the 2 million value by one and now I have a correct data set. Um, if I would have applied this deviation from the mean, it could also have flagged this problem, but the correction would not have been perfect. I, I show you the correction in orange, then it would have been 10 or 15 units. Um, that's fine, but that's not as correct as just saying, well, actually it's just mistyping here. So I should go back to a uh, demand transaction of one unit. Again, flagging wrong transaction takes a bit of time. You need to do a bit of data cleaning. You need to invest a bit of time into that. But once you have a data set by transaction, you can really clean transaction by transaction to make sure that everything is as correct as possible. Now, I receive more and more uh, projects where I'm, I'm lucky enough to um, see uh, pricing. And then you can even do better uh, demand cleaning. Now look at the left side of my screen. I have the demand pardon from for one of my clients. You see that we have four peaks. So you could be thinking, well, maybe these are or are not outliers. How do I know? But if you merge this with pricing, you can actually see that for two very specific day, the prices got close to zero. So most likely it's not that the client did a massive promotion because that's not an industry with promotion. It's more likely that they made some kind of correction transaction in SAP. So for example, they had to recount inventory or things like that, or maybe it's just something erroneous. So by comparing uh, average prices, we could flag two outliers. For sure, these two values should be excluded because something is wrong there. Again, I can only do that because here I got a data set transaction by transaction and I got a data set with prices that really allows me to pinpoint the very specific transaction that are wrong. Can you imagine doing this with your weekly or monthly bucket? It's, it's just impossible. You cannot do that. So you really need to have this transaction by transaction data set. Okay. Um, so that's for the uh, erroneous transaction. Let me then move on to shortages. Um, Many of you, most of you said, well, a big reason for outliers are shortages. Um, for me, I think that this is the third millennium, this is the 21st century. It is time that we include as a normal thing uh, shortages into our demand planning engine. But I realized that most software today, most forecasting tools do not care at all about shortages. And that's really a pity because as soon as you include shortages in your data set, in your forecast engine, you cannot drastically improve your forecasting accuracy very easily. So for me, bad practice currently for shortages would be trying to override your forecast during uh, shortages uh, that you have to manually flag that. I don't understand why you would have to manually do that because we should have the data. Something else that happens that's I think very bad, um, but that would be the subject for another webinar. If you have a shortage and you measure forecasting accuracy during a shortage, you're going to really penalize your demand planning team. You're going to penalize your software because your sales will be close to zero, but your demand planners started to uh, accurately predict very high number of demand. So someone would say, well, I think demand should be 1000, but we're going to sell zero because we have a shortage. This person's going to get penalized because you're going to compare the, 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 for, the demand forecast of 1000 units to the real sales of just zero. So this person is going to get penalized. That's not a good idea to um, track forecasting accuracy during a shortage. Okay. On the right side of the screen, I show this is again a real data set from a, a real client. Um, you and I know for a fact that during this red period you had shortages. And so I didn't flag these just because these were zeros. I know because I, I have the inventory data set that these are real uh, shortages. Um, of course, you cannot really do a forecast model if you don't know that these are shortages. You see that my constraint forecast goes to zero as we go through these shortages. 
because the usual software, the usual uh, forecast model, we just understand that you have a declining trend and your sales are zero, and in the future, you're going to hit zeros as well. So that's simply not working. What you need to do instead is to leverage this shortage data and automatically include that in your software. So basically, your forecast engine is aware of shortages and will start to bypass them. So as soon as you get into a shortage, the forecast engine is aware of that. Automatically, you stop tracking forecasting accuracy and you kind of freeze the forecast. So the forecast is not impacted by the fact that you have a lot of zero saves due to the shortage. OK, so as I'm including these shortages in my forecast engine, I basically don't have to consider these as outliers anymore. I don't need to spend time flagging them. I don't need to spend time worrying about them because this is basically automatically sorted out for me. So this is not a concern anymore. Again, I think it's really time that software vendors adapt to this, leverage this new data and include shortages as a normal demand driver in their um, models. That's what we do as subchains and I really wish that all supply chain would do the same. Again, if I had such a data set as the one here on this computer that I'm sure sharing with you, without inventory data, I wouldn't be able to really say that these are for sure shortages. Maybe you just saw zero pieces because that's what the real demand is like. But I know for a fact that we had shortages because I had access to inventory data that allowed me to do a better forecast. So very similarly to shortages, promotion are not outliers. Promotion are normal business. This will, If you are in a promotion driven market, you will have promotion in the future. You had promotion in the past. So if you keep on seeing promotion as outliers, you will stay into a very manual process, into poor forecasting accuracy, and into, I guess, headaches. Especially if you have to do long-term planning, it will be very difficult for you to do forecast with and without promotion. Um, for me, promotion should be one of the first things that should be included into your demand forecasting software so you can start to make different scenarios with and without promotion. But also in the past, when you had peaks because you did a promotion, it's not an outlier. It's just a normal point with a promotion and your forecast engine is aware of that. So it's very much like shortages. For me, shortages, promotion, uh, price changes, these should not be outliers. These are just normal business events. They will happen in the future. They happen in the past. It's all normal. And it is time that if you face that, that you include that in your forecast engine. Now, let me go back a few slides. Remember here, we did the first one I, I discussed with you about flagging wrong transaction. Uh, we talked about including business driver in your baseline model. So I think we covered most outliers you're facing right now but not all of them. I'm sure that even if we do everything we can to correct these transaction and everything we can to include promotion and shortages into your forecast engine, you will still have a few cases that kind of strange. So how do we spot these? Uh, because as I told you, this kind of deviation to the mean doesn't work great. So we should have some sort of last resort technique that would still allow us to flag these kind of last weird points. I got you covered, there is a technique for that. So remember the case I showed you earlier when I told you, well, if you do this kind of deviation from the mean, it doesn't work great because if you have seasonal data set or you have a data set with some trends, it's not going to point to the right uh, outliers. OK, now, if you do something else and, you, and if you do an analysis of deviation from the forecast and you say, well, an outlier is a point that the forecast engine didn't get correctly, then you can really find that here, for example, on the right side, you see that you have one point that actually is an outlier, even though this is not the highest value in the data set. But you see that here we have some peaks, but these peaks are just due to normal seasonality. So these are not outliers. Moreover, as soon as I do that and I want to correct this point, I'm not going to change the value by the average value in the data set. No, I can just replace it by the regular forecast and then I get a better correction. OK, it's basically the same concept as before. It's just that I improve it. It, uh, instead of doing deviation from the mean, I'm doing deviation from the forecast. Now, again, this is not the perfect technique, and that's why this is not the first technique I show you. I first told you we should correct the transaction, we should include shortages in your model, we should include promotion in your model, and then finally, as a last resort, we can still try to identify weird values by deviation from the forecast. Okay, so it's just the last resort. An example for that, and this is again a real data set from a, a, a client, it's um, deviation uh, due to COVID. So you can see here two points that are very weird. This is due to COVID. 
Um, I guess COVID will still cause trouble for the following years because it's going to stay in the data set for quite some time. So in case of points like this for COVID, what I usually do in project today is that I simply bypass them. So it's a bit like I would consider them as a shortage. I just tell the model not to pay any attention to March and April 2020, and I just move on and continue. Again, here, I would also uh, flag the COVID data points just by doing this deviation to the forecast. You can see that here I have this kind of gray area where I say, well, as this is a green zone. As long as I'm in the green zone, it's not an outlier. Here it's the same. As long as it's in the green zone, it's not an outlier. But you see that these two COVID data points are way beyond the green zone. These should then be flagged as outliers. Um, that's it for me. I think I went quite fast on the topic, so we have a lot of time to discuss all your questions. If you want to read more about outliers, I'll send you directly in the chat and you have them here. I will send you the PowerPoint two links to the recent articles I made about outliers, so you can learn even more about all these techniques. Um, I'll maybe stop sharing my screen for a second so I can catch my breath and drink some tea. And in the meantime, I will check if you have any kind of questions so we can have some nice discussion. Maybe I can go first. Um, yeah, Benjamin, tell me. Nicola, so you mentioned that you propose to stop monitoring the forecast accuracy during the period of shortages, right? That's, that's how I received your message. Uh, I think yeah. at that point, it is important to mention how the forecast accuracy is measured in your example. Um, because when you measure forecast accuracy more as a shipping plan versus what you have really shipped or that you say, OK, forecast what kind of demand is coming in and you measure that according to your customer request date, you would not need to stop measuring that. OK, so it depends. It's it's a great question. It really depends from one industry to another. Uh, yes. In general, what I advise doing is we forecast demand, we don't forecast shipment, and we don't forecast sales. Um, if you forecast shipment, it just depends on your logistic. If you forecast sales, it's very constrained, so also depends on your inventory and supply. So what we want is to forecast unconstrained demand from your client. Now, in some industries, you're lucky enough that you get orders from your client even when you have a shortage. Maybe you B2B, so your clients still call you, still book orders, so you don't care much about the shortage you still have good data, then it's not a concern for you. Um, in B2C, if you have a shortage, people will not record demand. Maybe you have a store. So if you're out of stock, you simply will sell zero and you have no idea. So this case here would more apply to B2C, where you don't record any kind of order as soon as you have a shortage. Then it makes perfect sense. Thank you for adding that information. You're welcome. Uh, let me read the question in the chat. If you have another question in the crowd, do not hesitate to leave a comment. I'll do my best to uh, discuss with you these outliers. So I got here two questions um, concerning these uh, promotion and another co uh, question concerning how far in the past we should go. Um, Including promotion in a forecast engine is a very interesting subject. You have two ways to do it. Um, either you're using some statistical engine right now, and then you have, um, for example, um, exponential smoothing, ARIMA, linear regression. You can try to include promotion into this type of model. It's not easy, and it will never be very accurate, and you will have a lot of limitation. Um, one of the worst limitations you'll face is that it's going to be extremely difficult for you to forecast a promotion if you never did the same promotion a few times in the past for this very specific product. And usually this does not happen a lot because when you think about it, like, I don't know, Christmas, New Year's, any kind of specific holidays or event during the year, it only happens once a year. So you don't have a lot of data. The way I like to do it is to use machine learning to do that. Because with machine learning, you can really understand the impact on promotion on different products. So even if you launch a new product and you do a promotion, the model will understand the impact of this promotion on another product. Um, so for promotion, the conclusion would be if you are in a promotion driven business where you tend to do a lot of promotion and this drives your sales, I would more be looking for how machine learning can help rather than try to fit that into uh, statistical models. Um, someone else asked, how far in the past should we clean outliers? Um, I know that many software vendors 
um, we'll always try to stick to we only include 36 months of demand. Well, I think this technique is kind of outdated. The models we have today, especially machine learning, but even statistical engine, they require more data to make more accurate uh, forecasts, especially if you want to include things such as promotion, for example. So sticking to only three years for me, it's not enough. I would always advise to go to four or five years. And if you can do more than that, do more than that, because this will really allow as soon as you use machine learning to really have a massive data set and get even better. Now, as soon as you say, well, I'm going to feed three years of data to my forecast engine. Let's just say three years or four years. It means that you need to clean outliers for these three years because any outliers you get into this data set will skew your forecast and will make them less accurate. So how, how far in the past should you go? Well, as much as you can is the right answer because as long as you have outliers in your data set, this will um, make your forecast uh, worse. Let me check for other questions. Wow, thank you so much. So many questions. I'll um, pick some. Let me just read that. So one of you, and I think it's it's a great question, is asking, um, I have a monthly data set. How do I include shortage in a monthly data set? Should I include the inventory position at the start of the month or at the end of the month? Um, unfortunately, you're facing kind of an issue there. Um, hopefully, shortages for you do not last a full month. That, that would be really bad. Um, and most of the time, I guess you have a shortage for a few days and then you get some new production or new supply shipments. So shortages most of the time just last a few days. Um, the issue we have is that as soon as you have monthly bucket, it's not really clear is this demand is correct or not, because maybe you had the shortage of 10 days during the month. Should we consider the month as a shortage? Yes, no. It's kind of complicated. So what I like to do is always try to forecast demand per week because then it's much clearer if the week should be considered as an outlier because of a shortage, yes or no. If you do monthly bucket, this is going to be very difficult. So I would say that as a supply chain, um, if you want to get an edge in demand planning and demand forecasting accuracy, I would move from monthly forecast to weekly forecast because this will allow you to get all this data about shortages and make and improve the quality of your forecast. But this should also allow you to include more information, for example, about um, promotion. Um, someone else is saying, well, we don't use demand, but clean shipments. I would not advise to forecast shipment. I do not advise to forecast sales. I do not, for I do not advise to forecast invoices, units, or these kind of things. We want to forecast unconstrained demand from your clients. Now, the case you might face is that as you have shortages, you have kind of an explosion of orders because your clients are calling every day to make new orders. And this is why you should consider shortage periods uh, as outliers and remove them as I showed. So you basically try to track when you had inventory or not, and you remove the period where you had no inventory. You treat them as outlier. You bypass that when you make a forecast. Now, if you start to make a forecast based on shipment, you might get into some vicious circle where you could only ship 1,000, so you start only to forecast 1,000, so the person responsible for the size of the warehouse only plans for 1,000, and then you still are in a shortage um, simply because you can never forecast more than 1,000 because this is the maximum shipment capacity you have. So you stay stuck in a vicious circle. Again, we need to forecast unconstrained demand. We should never forecast constrained sales, shipment, invoices, or these kind of things. Yeah, I have another question. I will, I will go back to shortages. The, the case I show here, it's, 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 it's a B2C case where we don't track orders from clients. Again, in different companies, different industry, maybe your client will still make orders even when you have a shortage. Or maybe if you face a shortage, you have an ability to track cancel order due to the shortage. So actually for you, if you just have a short term shortage of just a few days, you don't really care so much because you have the ability to track all these orders into your system and you have the ability to track cancel orders. 
So you, you don't really need to do all of this for these shortages because you have a good order management system. Now for all of us uh, facing B2C, then you might have to do that because there is no way you have this order management system. So here it a bit depends on your industry. I should add on the slide, this is more for um, B2C. So thank you for all these questions. I'll, I'll still take a few of these. Someone is asking a um, question about spot uh, spot orders, uh, Catherine. That that's an excellent question, uh, Catherine. I think I can go back to the initial question I asked you about this spot deal. So many of you said, well, spot deals should be considered as outliers, and I fully understand that. Um, it makes a lot of sense for me when you want to do your baseline forecast to remove spot deals and to be able to flag them and exclude them. Now, the way I would flag and spot, um, to, the, the way I would flag spot deals, I would really do it the same way as wrong transaction. I would try to really spot the exact, sorry, I would really try to flag the exact transaction and be able to remove that. Either because spot deals are made through a specific code, or maybe because the price of this transaction is not the usual one, or maybe the sales channel would be different. So I would try to exclude this very specific transaction from the data set and do a forecast without that. One of the issue of doing that, I, I think that's the way to do it, but one of the issues is that once you're gonna get a very top, top view, aggregated view on your forecast, you will see that your total volume is not as high as you expect. Why? Because you've removed all the spot deals. Nevertheless, I think we should remove that from the, the, the sales engine. So very good comment, Catherine. I, I, um, I missed this one. I, I should have added a, a slide on that. So Philippe is also asking a question um, concerning um, shortages. Uh, again, shortages, as, as you all know, we have this kind of uh, peaks that can follow a shortage because everyone is doing orders again. Again, my solution for shortage is very simple. If you face shortages and this creates some up and downs in your demand and demand goes to zero and then you get again a lot of orders or maybe the other way around, as soon as you have a shortage, you have like piles of orders and then as soon as you have inventory again, all these orders are canceled. My solution to that is simple. If you don't have a good way to track all these orders, simply automatically load shortage information in your tool, flag all these periods as basically outliers and bypass them. That's really the advice for shortages. If you suffer from shortages, find a way to flag these automatically in your tool and simply ask your statistical engine to never to take these ones into account when making a forecast. This will basically solve the problem. And if you face um, a business where as soon as you have inventory again, you get peaks of order because of, of all the past short shortages, then we can also remove an extra or two extra weeks of demand because we know that if you had a shortage of four weeks, then people are gonna make a lot of orders during the next two weeks. We can also automatically remove that. And that would allow you to easily clean in a very automated way all your data set. I hope this is clear, Philippe, otherwise you can always send another question. I'm, I'm happy to help again. Um, I'll do another two questions and then we'll stop. So it would last 45 minutes. I think that's the right duration for a webinar. Um, so here someone is asking, how do we identify demand? So again, we want to forecast demand. We never want to forecast sales. We don't want to forecast shipment. We don't want to forecast invoices. The right thing we should forecast is unconstrained demand, which I like to track as the initially requested delivery date, product, and quantity. Okay. So what we want to track is initially requested delivery date, product, quantity. This is what we want to forecast. If you start forecasting something else, it means that you include any kind of type of logistical constraint into your forecast. This is really bad and it, you're going to end up in a kind of a vicious circle. I see, a, I see many great, great questions. I'm going to stick to question concerning outliers. I, I see like many great ones. Let me pick a last question. Mm -hmm. 
So someone else is also asking, I will stop uh, sharing the screen. Someone else is also asking the question on how do we deal with outliers and intermittent demands? Um, intermittent demand is definitely difficult to forecast. So there is no kind of magic solution or secret technique that will allow you to reach 90% forecasting accuracy on intermittent demand. Um, if you have a lot of intermittent demand, I would try to spend time to understand what's causing that. Is it an issue of shortages in promotion? We just talked about it. I think now you have ideas on how to solve that. Um, maybe it's also a question of how your client decides to make order. Maybe you just have a few clients and when they do an order, they always order a full truckload. So you have a demand that's really flat, close to zero, and then you have peaks with just one full truckload. If that's the case and you just have a few clients, maybe the solution is to start to partner with them, to give them a call, to try to ask them um, when do they plan to make an order or if you can have a view at their current inventory level. So for me, very intermittent data set are very difficult to manage. I would investigate time in terms of business to try to understand the root cause and then find a custom solution to that. Um, I'm going to stop the webinar here. It was a pleasure for me to uh, share this content with you. I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed the time together. And foremost, I hope that it was helpful for you and you will be able to um, use that uh, when you forecast demand. I will send you the slides. Thank you so much for your participation. Thank you for those of you who shared the webcam. Thank you, Benjamin. Have a great day, Emiliano as well. Um, thank you so much for all of you asking questions. Sorry, I didn't have the time to answer everything. If you're really in trouble with these outliers, do not hesitate to drop me uh, an email. Um, I will anyway send you myself a follow-up email with, with the, the slides. Take care, everyone. Have a great day, and uh, see you next time. Thank you so much. Ciao.